Welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa, and uh, we're set for our first major conversation, uh, which is on corruption. And of course, corruption in Nigeria uh, is a constant phenomenon. In 2012, Nigeria was estimated to have lost over $400 billion to corruption since its independence. And of course, 10 years on, uh, you can do the math, the amount has definitely increased. Now, recall that recently uh, the country ranked 150th uh, in the 180 countries listed by Transparency International in its Corruption Perception Index for the year 2022. Now, the history and impact of corruption in Nigeria is quite well documented, but what about uh, the political economy of corruption in Nigeria? Joining us to discuss this is uh, Dr. Enamdi Igbokwe. He is um, a political economist. He's also an expert in uh, corruption matters. I'm glad to have him join us right from the United States city of New York, uh, the Big Apple. And Namdi Bukwe, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be with you. All right. Um, let, let's look at uh, the political economy in, you know, in Nigeria and the political economy of corruption. When we talk about the political economy of corruption, what are we talking about here? Oh, thank you. That, that's a great question, a great way to start. Uh, the ubiquity of corruption, as you mentioned, uh, in Nigeria is well known. It's well documented. The numbers are too vast to count. The offenses are too staggering to believe sometimes. Uh, corruption is consistently the explanation for Nigeria's seemingly unsolvable problems, from economic development to social unrest. But to understand corruption, you must place parameters around it. You must put boundaries on the investigation. So when we refer to the political economy of corruption, we are doing just that. We're pointing at economic and political conditions that allow corruption to endure. So we think about what are the constellations of political and economic factors that create this conducive environment for corruption. So we know that corruption occurs at this interface, this intersection of public and private sector. So political economy aims to examine how the political and economic factors inform the cause and explain the social consequences of corruption. So in Nigeria's context, it also broadly formulates frames of investigation as internal or political institutions and external or economic factors. And this is the same, this is the exact frame that I've used to investigate corruption and research the political economy of corruption in Nigeria. Interesting. Um, I mean, we talk about corruption, we hear it being said there's corruption all over the world. I mean, some people even argue that uh, corruption in the United States of America, where you are based, is, is much more than what we have in Nigeria. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with that. But you can speak to that and also uh, talk about what exactly is distinct about the corruption in Nigeria compared to other parts of the world. Yeah, you are exactly right, and I will not argue with that. Uh, corruption itself is not specific to Nigeria. Let's make that clear. It's not necessarily distinct to Nigeria, but it is distinctive in Nigeria. But let's take a step back, right? Corruption is present universally across time, historically, and space geographically. So historically, whether you go to ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, medieval times, revolutionary United States, you will find corruption. There's no society devoid of corruption, to be clear. But Nigeria is uniquely and simultaneously, somehow the richest country in Africa, depending on which metric you use, and still one of the poverty capitals of the world. So as a result, corruption becomes this major explanation for all of Nigeria's development problems. So in Nigeria's case, corruption has become endemic to where it's not only accepted, but expected. And this is what's distinctive. The logic of corruption in Nigeria has been so institutionalized and diffused throughout all segments of public life and private life, that you have to ask, how did this happen? How did this become so distinctive? And this is the interrogation that I've used moving forward to look at the political economy of corruption. And I investigate this directly by explaining not the origin story of corruption, because if you think about you know, man and egoism and how he is continuously pursuing self-service, that is not the argument here. Or that's not the in in interrogation here. But rather, it's the development story of corruption that's entrenched in the political economy in Nigeria's history. So if we think about post-independent Nigeria, or even post-war Nigeria, there are two constants for the better part of the last half century, right? You have 
military rule or leadership, and you have corruption. Now, this association, this intersection, uh, is how you use the internal political factors and external economic conditions to identify the cause. And what I've done is identified a singular actor in Nigeria that I have termed the capitalist militician. Now, what this is, is a unification of an agent of military power, an agent of political position, and an agent of capital accumulation into one singular mantle of power. And this is what's happened in Nigeria directly post-war and more indirectly post-democratic transition in 1999. So this triumvirate is distinct to Nigeria and Nigerian politics. Nowhere else do we see this intersectionality produced and reproduced over time. Yes, we have dictators on the continent that you can point to. There's presidents in Europe uh, and in the United States that might share some characteristics. But if I'm thinking about the, the con uh, character of the capitalist militician, they are multiple in power, and whereas the others are singular in their articulation of power. So what this means broadly is Nigeria has reproduced this actor, this capitalist militician, for over 50 years. So when you have this nexus of power, this particular agent regarding capital accumulation and distribution, corruption emerges, corruption evolves. So to simplify, the rise of corruption in Nigeria, the distinctive nature of corruption in Nigeria re revolves around the construction of this capitalist militia and this figure's relationship to external global economic markets and internal political institutional change. And by exploring this figure, this concept, we get to better understand the political economy of corruption in Nigeria historically and in a more present context. All right, uh, let's, uh, Namdi, let's take a quick look at the corruption index in Nigeria for 2022. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the perception index in Nigeria remained on change at 24 points in 2022. Now, if you look at 2021, it was also 24 uh, points, and 2020 was 25, uh, 2019 was 26. 2018 was 27, 27 also in 2017, and 28 in 2016. What exactly does this mean? To be quite frank, it, it means next to nothing in my estimation, and I'll tell you why. The key word, before you ran over all of those metrics across the years for Nigeria, is perception. We're talking about a perception index. And although Transparency International does wonderful things around corruption and in putting together this barometer, you have to remember that their methodology is based on largely surveys that are handed out and administered to business people. And they're giving sort of this impression or their interpretation of how hard or how easy is it to do business in a place like Nigeria or a place like South Africa or a place like Brazil or a place like Botswana. And based on that perception, you now get these scores. So objectively, you can maybe get a facsimile of what it means to compare countries on, on a, cor a corruption scale. But specifically, to really gauge a country's level of corruption, you have to dive in and you have to understand the nuances of what it means to be corrupt in that setting. Because certain actions that you might see exhibited in one country may not be corrupt on another. Certain laws that permit certain actions are not universal. There is no normativity to corruption, but what they've tried to do is create a normative scale. So by and large, it is a representation that gives you an idea, but I would take it with a very, very small pinch of salt because all it is is representing the perception of corruption, depending on whose per perception and depending on whose baseline of morality or normal activity that is being compared against. Uh, you, you talked about um, the, the uh, triumvirate uh, of um, military power, um, you know, uh, political power and um, capitalism or capital power, if you want to call it, as being that um, distinctive uh, nature or representing a distinctive nature of corruption in Nigeria as compared mm -hmm. to other parts of the world. And you said that corruption in Nigeria is endemic. It's uh, expected and accepted. So in other words, it's a way of life. Um, is breaking this, this, this Bermuda Triangle of corruption, if, me to call, if I can call it that, is breaking that triangle uh, the key to you know, solving the corruption problem in the country? And how uh, can it be broken if that is the key? Or how can it be solved if 
uh, there are other ways to do this. Remember that Nigeria has uh, what many countries have used as a benchmark, uh, anti-corruption bodies. We have the Economic mm -hmm. and Financial Crimes Commission, we have the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Offenses Commission, which other countries, especially on the African continent and need in West Africa, they've adopted such an approach for their own uh, corruption fight. So, so what do you say to that? How can we break that triangle? So I will say broadly speaking, there are initiatives, there are transparency initiatives, there are institutions that have been erected to specifically go after corruption, to fight corruption, to prevent corruption. Um, the level of, of success, I leave it to everyone to assess on their own. Uh, oftentimes you see that some of these institutions become, corruption, become corrupt in their own right. Uh, so I, I won't speak to the prescriptive nature too much because, again, you have to kind of narrow in where you're dealing with and what you're dealing with. But if I talk about this capitalist militation and this triumvirate, as you put it, uh, I think that's a first key step in understanding it and then departing from it. And this is what really links this election uh, and our present in terms of what we can do and what we can understand in terms of what's his, what has happened in the past uh, through the construction of this capitalist militation and what we hope to achieve in the present and moving forward. All right. So there's a very popular saying that uh, corrupt society would always throw up corrupt leaders. And mm -hmm. we probably might just, you know, link that to the case of Nigeria. Well, probably might just be a reflection of who we are because, I mean, if you look at the practices on a daily basis and our behavior, you can say that we're corrupt. I'd like you to share your thoughts on that. Do you really agree with this school of thought? Are we a reflection of our leaders? That's an excellent question. And simply put, yes. And I'll, let me go deep a bit and explain what I mean, uh, because it's not a simple answer. They say that if you don't understand your past, you're bound to repeat it. So in terms of the political economy, the capitalist militation in Nigeria really transformed political power into economic power. We need to remember that it's not a person per se, it's a position of power, right? There's minimal difference between Nigeria's 20th century and early 21st century political era of, of executive power, uh, except for this veneer of democratic politics. But you know that the capitalist militation has been embedded into the fabric of Nigeria's political ecosystem since independence. This figure arrived post-war and has remained a centerpiece in the political arena in Nigeria. Uh, I, I remember famously Gowan said that the military underwent a misguided adventure into politics, where military men were turned into statesmen at the helm of capital distribution. Now, to get back to your question about society and this figure, this capitalist militation and corruption, that relation to capital is key, right? The military agent was transformed into a political implementer of development policy and mediator of development capital. This shift from military power to political power to economic power. Now, we factor in other aspects of the Nigerian economy, other shocks like foreign and direct investment, multinational interests with oil, uh, sovereign debt, structural adjustment policies, development loans, devalued currency, the list goes on and on. What happened is that state institutions then became the primary source of resource generation and capital accumulation. So this capitalist militician figure began to manage the state as a resource reservoir in Nigeria, right? The middle class and the capitalist class and the elite class then gravitated towards the state as a source for capital accumulation. And to this day, or in recent history, if someone has a financial windfall, you either say, you don't, you don't necessarily say, did you get a new job? Did you start a business? Did you win the lottery? Typically, what you, your mind goes to is, what government contract did you get? So this reservoir, of this resource reservoir was created where the state is accumulating and distributing capital, right? What happened with that is that there was an increase in capital and there's an intermingling of the capitalist militation to civil society. Okay, so instead of just being in one specific institutional lane, it then bled through to politics, to economics and capital, and now to society. And it became a matter of accumulating capital for status and social superiority. So the behavior of the capitalist mil militician became mimicked, became imbued to society at large in terms of status, in terms of elitism, 
if you have power so, so in other words uh, namdi i like to cut you in there in other words you're saying that uh, you know the, the behavior that we have in practice i mean the fact that people are behaving a certain way which uh, society would probably have tagged as corrupt is as a result of the system and structure that we've had over time am i correct that, that's correct not not exclusively but a majority of that behavior, is, especially in relation to the state and capital accumulation, was reproduced uh, from the creation of this capitalist militation. Absolutely. So, I mean, I mean let's even come back to, uh, you know, we're in 2023. We're getting close to the elections right here in Nigeria. A few more days, the elections would be here. Uh, this something, you know, this you know, uh, a word or a phrase that we have had over time, and it's called vote buying. And poverty and hunger works hand in hand. So um, how do you describe that? The fact where you have those who are seeking political office would, you know, entice uh, the electorate to, uh, you know, cast their votes for them in exchange for maybe uh, material stuff or money at the end. How then do we classify this? Is that still corruption? Mm -hmm. It, it is still corruption, in one word, unsurprising, and I'll tell you why. We have to remember the age of Nigeria as a country. We've only been independent since 1960. In the 19th century, the United States, which was over 100 years old at the time, was famous for electoral corruption. There's even a saying that during that time, they used to turn money into whiskey and whiskey into votes, which meant they were bribing the constituents to basically vote on the terms that they would uh, state was beneficial, or maybe not beneficial. So this is nothing new. Unfortunately, it's part and parcel with the democratic and electoral system, but it doesn't mean that it's right. It just means that it's an opportunity to be corrected and to shift that type of behavior. But in one word, it's unsur ins unsurprising. Uh, and in another word, that yes, it is corrupt. All right. So let's, let's quickly talk about, since we've gone to the 2023 elections, um, uh, what, what should, how should Nigerians think about uh, this this whole issue of the political economy of corruption and uh, you know how it's it's played out in the past and in, indeed in the present in relation to the forthcoming election. Yeah, this is a massive opportunity. Uh, it's a punctuated moment in Nigeria's political economy because for so long leadership has been defined not by elite people but elite positions, right? Positions that occupied power were abused and appropriated. So for the first time in a very, very long time, or perhaps ever, Nigeria has an opportunity to elect leadership that looks a little bit different, that starts to depart from that status quo, from that monolithic sort of structure that has been constructed and endured for over 50 years. There is a great opportunity, depending, regardless of who you pick, irrespective of your favorite candidate, there is a great opportunity to now course correct the political institutions in Nigeria and start moving forward in the manner that was intended in terms of leaders and not just elite positions of power. So I would tell everyone to take this election very, very seriously and inform yourself and participate. But this is a monumental moment in the political economy of Nigeria because for the first time in nearly half a century, we are looking at an option and options that allow us to move forward with leaders in a proper sense. You know, you know some people say, you know, um, uh, nothing will change, you know, because the system itself is built to, um, it's built on corruption, it's built to protect uh, you know, corrupt individuals, uh, those who are in the establishment, those who benefit from graft. You know, with, with the leading candidates, we have about four of them, or if you want to make it three, uh, do you see a possibility of any of them, if they emerge as a president of Nigeria, call it a wonderful opportunity? Um, none of them has a direct link to the military, even though one of them was a customs officer. But do you see, do you see a possibility of any of them really truly breaking Nigeria free from the reins of corruption, looking at the system that has, you know, been put in place. Uh, Muhammad mm -hmm. Buhari campaigned on, on the basis or on the mantra of anti-corruption in 2015 and love Nigerians were tired of the regime of Jonathan, good luck Jonathan, and saw it as a corrupt administration. Uh, looked to Buhari being uh, 
uh, seen as a no-nonsense disciplinarian of, it, of a, a military dictator from years uh, uh, gone by uh, to come in and clean the system. But, you know, the rest is history. Will anything change after 2023? So I will say conceptually change is inevitable. It's a part of politics. It's a part of economics. It's a part of social behavior. Change will come. The level of that change or the incremental nature of that change is what's unknown. Is there a possibility? I certainly believe that there is. I, I really do. Uh, the reason being is because when you think about the vestiges of what I just explained for the last 15, 20 minutes, they're, tr they're starting to erode. And it starts with the expectation of the, pub the public and what they call and demand for from their leaders. So will it change overnight? Absolutely not. We're not going to wake up in March and say, okay, everything is different, or even next year and say everything is different. But incremental steps and a pursuit of something different and a departure from what's been known is all that we're asking for to start moving towards that eventual target state. Again, remember that Nigeria has been, has been independent since 1960. And while we are a dominant player and a major player in the world economic system, we still have to temper expectations with how we are developing and the trajectory that we're on. Can there be change? Absolutely. Will it be overnight? Absolutely not but it can certainly happen, and this election is a great opportunity for it to start. So, um, I mean, let's... Yes, yeah, yeah, but before Messi comes up, you know, I would like to take you on on that, because, um, you know, each of the leading candidates they've engaged in, you know, visits. Um, uh, the culture here is you want to be president, you have to visit certain persons uh, who are seen as godfathers, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get their blessing and also endorsement as well. And I think uh, all three or four of the leading candidates have um, visited the major godfathers, including uh, former military dictators. I'm talking about uh, uh, the likes of Olusha Gobasa and Joe and Ibrahim Babangida. Um, I mean, you have some a section, just a very few, maybe one or two of the presidential candidates, not leading, who um, have a campaigning on the, with, a, uh, on, on, with a slogan on mandate of uh, uh, fighting corruption and going after those who have um, stolen Nigeria's you know, commonwealth. Now, none of the leading candidates as we speak has said they're going to go after any of those, you know, who have stolen or who are, who are perceived, perceived to have um, been a part of the problem, like you've talked mm -hmm. about the history. Um, I mean, that's number one. Number two, all the leading candidates are engaging in political horse trading, you know, going to see Mr. A or Mr. B, who is perceived also to be part of the problem we're talking about. Support me in your state. Give me votes from your state. Help me to do this. And of course, it's not going to be free of charge. So won't mm -hmm. these guys come into power, any of them that win, because there's a lot of post trading going on and back slapping, um, won't they come into power with their hands tied? Well, it depends how, on your perspective, right? If I'm looking at the context of the capitalist militation, where we see that intersection of political power, military power, and economic power in one, we already see that that no longer can be the case with this election. If we think about it as a core, you might have a core that's the capitalist politician, you might have agents that are circling or orbiting, orbiting that core, and then you might have a periphery that has nothing to do. I don't know that we've got to the periphery yet, but we're certainly in that orbit where that axis of power is probably going to slowly and slowly lessen and get less and less potent because of the nature of that position. Uh, what you are explaining is nothing that has not been seen everywhere in politics. Politics and economics intersect traditionally, historically, and will do so probably until the end of time. But it's that other intersection that has become the igniting factor for Nigeria's corruption state. Because if we look at the United States, we look at Italy, we look at rulers across and presidents across the world, businessmen and politicians have always sort of done this log rolling. It's always been a, a logic between them. But when you introduce another factor and it's a singular player, a singular agent where you don't necessarily have to scratch a back, you just, it's one, then you have other articulations of power that become dangerous. So we're already departing from that. And I think we'll continue to depart from that because the nature of what the institution is, is evolving. So, uh, so again, I go back to the last question of will there be change? Yes, but it will be incremental. So, but I'd like you to quickly run through this. I mean, looking at the state of our economy right now, do you think that, uh, as it is, we're probably grappling with uh, scarcity of the Naira? 
grappling with mm -hmm. petrol scarcity. I mean, petrol is not available for the consumption of Nigerians and what have you. So the list might almost be endless. Do you think that these are the effects of corruption on us? I mean, what we're currently going through as at today? Well, I, I won't venture to simplify that it's just the effects of corruption. Uh, you know, there have been policies put in place. Uh, there have been conditions, there have been exogenous shocks. Uh, the global economy itself has seen a downturn. Uh, but for Nigeria specifically, uh, public finance and increase of stock and debt and debt servicing needs are paramount. Whoever you know ascends to that position of president will need to address those things. Uh, it's not as simple as just pointing to corruption and saying this is the cause. Uh, is it a helpful or is it a uh, exacerbating factor? Surely it is. When you have something that's so institutionalized, uh, it, it cannot help. Uh, but is it the sole cause or the primary cause? I wouldn't venture, venture to say that because there's other factors at play as well. So I don't want to simplify because that's what I you know, commented at in the beginning that oftentimes all of Nigeria's development failures or shortcomings are pointed to corruption. So I don't want to come full circle and then say it's cause of corruption. But understanding the history of it and understanding how we can step away from it, I think is a good step in terms of then being able to put policies in place, then being able to look after increasing the revenue of the country, then being able to address some of these macroeconomic issues uh, to then help move Nigeria forward with issues of the Naira, which is so, with so issues I mean, of... I mean, I mean, if you're in a position to, you know, formulate policies, agree to policies for the betterment and development of the country, and you refuse mm -hmm. to do that, how, how do we classify all of this? Well, that's just a failure. And uh, a failure in maybe the process or a failure in the confidence that we put into the elected official. Uh, but again, hypothetically, corruption could play a role, uh, but I would not venture to now and say that that would be the resulting uh, determining factor. Uh, there, there's too many things at play to, the, to just say it's corruption. But we have to understand that the history and the role corruption has played and presently plays, and hopefully in the future will play less and less of a role. So, so, but does this really have like an impact on an economy? And do you think that all of this over time has an impact on Nigeria? It definitely has an impact on economy. If we bring it to a macro level, even the perception, which I you know, spoke a bit about and, and gave my thoughts on in terms of these indices, but even if you change perception, perception sometimes does become real. It becomes self-fulfilling. Uh, so yes, you can change sort of outputs and outcomes, um, but it, it really starts with who we are deciding to put in that position of power and how that position of power takes shape apart from or in departure of what we've seen historically. And that's the exciting part, is that for 50 plus years, we've seen one sort of mantle of leadership and power, and now we get to redefine that. All right. Um, uh, we look at uh, corruption in Nigeria and we're looking at also the fact that we live in a global world. Um, I mean, what, what do you say is the role of the international community in, in ensuring that not just Nigeria, but African countries uh, do not suffer from corruption? I mean, we can talk about the Swiss banks. Um, we can talk about the, um, uh, the safe havens where African dictators and leaders and presidents um, are able to store stolen money away. And then when you know, the countries try to get the money back. We have to negotiate with these countries. Um, of course, the international community may, uh, do you agree they have a role to play? And what role can they play? How can they go about helping to ensure corruption in Nigeria and indeed Africa is, is nipped in the bud? The role that the international community can play has to be secondary to the role Nigeria plays for itself. Uh, I'm glad you, put, you brought up in these, uh, these foreign banks you know, part of my study of political economy of corruption in the capitalist politician is a four-part volume, and the second part is looking at capital flight. You have all this money, you have all this capital that's absconded, but it leaves the shores of Nigeria. What does that mean for development? But getting back to your question, uh, we, we can't rely on the international community because if we really think about the course of economic development across the 20th century, the international community and international organizations can be looked at as part of the proximate causes for why Nigeria had such unstable political institutions in the first place. Uh, so I would say that for developing countries, Nigeria specifically, you have to superintend your own development. So it has to start here. Um, are there ways and in, in, in means that the international community can help and assist? Of course, without a doubt. Uh, but that has to be secondary or even tertiary. It has to start internally. All right. 
All right, uh, Dr. Namdik Bokwe, it's uh, quite interesting uh, you know, sharing your thoughts with us, especially from your studies as far as uh, politic, uh, the political economy is concerned in the corruption in Nigeria. Uh, the, the 2023 elections are very important to this country and uh, corruption, you've said, you know, is one of the issues we should, um, we should focus on. We'll look to see, you know, what the candidates say in the, in the days leading to uh, the election. Indeed, we have uh, some questions about some candidates, but, uh, you know, nobody has been able to do anything about any of these questions. I can give you examples. For instance, uh, Peter Obi has had the Pandora Papers uh, um, issue. Uh, you know, uh, and it's not been truly, to totally addressed. If you look at Bola Metinbu, he's had um, issues to do with uh, um, his age, his um, uh, qualifications, you know, and of course, uh, as an allegation of drug um, conviction in the United States of America, which I'm sure you may be familiar with. If we go to Atiko Abubakar, I mean, he's... Um, his, his, his dealings when he was vice president and head of Nigeria's privatization drive uh, in 1999 following the return to democracy, some have questioned that. And indeed, a recent um, uh, audio recording that uh, you know, is alleg alleging that he was talking about um, you know, shell companies, for instance, um, uh, and the spe special purpose vehicles, SPVs. Um, so, so you have all these questions regarding all these guys, the top three of them. Um, w w what do we do? <laughs> the election is just around the corner. Well, again, uh, there's a laundry list. And if we go through all the leadership of the past, I, I think that list will get even longer. Uh, so the idea is not that our candidates or our public servants or people in positions of leadership will not engage in activity that we might scratch our head or, or raise an eyebrow to. Um, this is sort of the way politics occurs even in the United States. Uh, but the, the question that you're asking is really for the public to gauge and compare and look for the leader that they think can move Nigeria into the right direction. You know, you're not going to have anyone who is an angel. You're not going to have anyone who has a complete clean slate. Uh, all of these things, whether alleged or real, uh, the, the, the opportunity is there and the options are there for the public to decide. And the exciting part for me is that for the first time, that decision is going to be outside the rubric of this institution of the capitalist militation that we've seen for far too long. So uh, in as much as these are very important points that you're raising and things that need to be considered, uh, broadly, I think moving away from what has been entrenched in the politics and economics of this country is a major step in that right direction that I've been talking about. All right. I want to thank you very much for your time, uh, Dr. Namdi Bokwe, political economist, um, expert in corruption uh, studies. Um, of course, I uh, will look forward to discussing some more with you, especially as uh, your ongoing um, your research in this area is concerned. And uh, we wish you the best. Probably have you sometime soon before the elections. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. We plan to see you soon. Thank you. All right. And uh, we have more conversations coming up. Mercy, I don't think the Naira is uh, something we can run away from every single time we're on this program. What are well, we? We'll definitely talk about, about the Naira year? as we inch closer to the elections. Few more days before that elections, we also anticipate and believe that you have your PVCs and you're ready to go cast your vote, which is you know your civic responsibility. We take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about the impact of you know, this non-availability of the Naira on the health of Nigerians. Please stay with us. Good morning.